The next company that's presenting is Antisense Therapeutics. Their ticker on the ASX is ANP. Uh, today, we've got the CEO, Mark Diamond, joining us. Uh, how are you, Mark? Yeah, well, thanks, Tim. Good to hear. Good, good to see you again. Uh, now, Antisense is developing Antisense Pharmaceuticals for large unmet markets in rare disease. Uh, their lead program focuses on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, or today we'll, we'll call it DMD. Um, and, you know, they've licensed um, their, their lead program from Ionis Pharmaceuticals, which is NASDAQ. Um, established leader in the drug development space for antisense drugs. Um, so, Mark, I believe today you'll be taking us across the presentation and then we'll do a couple of questions at the end. Um, but over to you. Oh, terrific, Tim. Let me, uh, as you suggest, bring up the presentation. How's that going? Thumbs up. Thanks, Tim. So, look, it's a pleasure to be presenting again uh, today, Tim. And, you know, for uh, those on the call that perhaps I'm familiar with, uh, Antisense Therapeutics, the company is focused on advancing its pipeline of antisense compounds with a specific focus in the rare disease space. Uh, in the Y rare disease, one of the main drivers is the development incentives that are presented to companies that are uh, looking at developing drugs for rare diseases. And so these extend to additional IP protection, but also more rapid development with accelerated pathways towards commercialization. And so Tim, the faster the development, generally speaking, the you know, the less cost associated as well too. But one of the other um, important drivers is that generally speaking, you know, the rare disease drugs are afforded premium pricing and also generally less competition. So, you know, we think it's a really attractive space to, to be playing in. Uh, you correctly highlighted our important relationship with Ionis Pharmaceuticals. In fact, we think that uh, we've probably got a unique uh, business model amongst ASX listed biotechnology companies and having accessed our drugs from uh, a, a big brother, as it were, and, you know, as you noted, with the world leader in the field of antisense uh, drug technology and development. Uh, I understand now have three approved drugs on the market. Uh, they've both uh, approved with US and European regulatory authorities, another 30 that are in active clinical development. Many of those uh, with some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And you can rattle off uh, a list of the, the major pharma companies that they're collaborating with, AstraZeneca, Roche, Biogen, Novartis, GSK. So now we really are in a lead company, as it were, in having exclusive access to a, a substantially uh, de-risked platform technology from the biggest player in the field. Uh, one other important uh, point to note about the success at Ionis Pharmaceuticals is that, uh, Tim, they have a, a partnership with Biogen where they've developed up a drug for a rare paediatric muscle wasting disease called spinal muscular atrophy and the relevance to antisense therapeutics hopefully will be uh, be evident soon when I talk to our lead program but this drug now uh, called Spinraza is selling in excess of two billion dollars annually so it speaks we believe to the commercial potential of our own drug for a rare paediatric muscle wasting disease and, and of course it is to share muscular dystrophy or uh, DMD, as you highlighted before. Tim, this is uh, a rare incurable muscle wasting disease of children. There are no effective therapies. Uh, and because of the size of the market, the high amount medical need, market's estimated to grow to as big as $10 billion by 2030. We've uh, completed a successful phase two clinical trial. I've taken people through that data previously tim on your uh, on your platform here i'll touch on that today in my presentation but what is really exciting is is that we're about to embark on a phase two clinical trial that we're looking to run in both europe and australia and we're expecting to kick that study off this year and that it really is uh, a program that could deliver multi-billion dollar market potential just given the high pricing afforded to dmd treatments the 
relatively large patient population for a rare disease and the high amount of medical need, it does really equate to a, a massive, you know, a, a massive opportunity. If we can su uh, successfully deliver a, a, a an effective therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we think we're well down that path. Corporate overview, uh, we just recently reported uh, our uh, cash at the end of September. You'll see it highlighted there, 18 million in the bank. Our major shareholder continues to be Platinum Asset Management. They're there at just under 5%. Platinum Asset Management are a global institutional investor and they've been on our register since we started the program in, in Duchenne's in 2019, and, and importantly, Tim, and you've heard me say this before, they participate in every subsequent capital raising that we've done to support the D Duchenne Muscular District Program. And recently, we're in the, the financing we did at the end of 2021 when we're raised capital at 24 cents. So we're delighted to have them on the register as a, as a supportive shareholder. Uh, we've also noted on this slide that research coverage, I think uh, it's fair to say that we would be one of the broadest covered, if not the, the uh, company with the greatest coverage amongst the local biotechnology uh, analysts. All that research is available on our website for anyone who wants to do a deeper dive into the company. I would uh, point to our board and management team. It's no understatement to, to suggest that you know, this is a highly experienced team with a, a tremendous track record in successful drug development and commercialization won't go into detail here tim on the slide but point out a couple of you know relatively recent new appointments to the board just last year shaman gittleson joined uh, joined the company as a non-executive director has subsequently gone on as chair uh Charmaine is a uh, seasoned uh, international uh, experienced pharmaceutical executive was 15 years at uh, csl uh, most recently is their medical director. Probably highlight though, Tim, that uh, in a time at CSL, Charmaine was senior VP of clinical development. She had a team of 350 people reporting to her, uh, had a budget, I know, of over 400 million, had uh, the whole of R&D clinical development reporting into her. But in the time when she was at CSL, was responsible for shepherding five you know, uh, new products onto the market and a number of them being rare disease products. So we're you know, again, very fortunate to have someone of the caliber of Charmaine on the board. Gil Price, again, recent appointment to the board, experienced uh, a clinician, a drug development clinician. And for us, most importantly, has had a lot of, uh, lot of experience in the development of Duchenne's drugs. This was a game when he was on the board of uh, Sarepta Therapeutics, as we know, they are the leader in, in the field of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy treatments today, market cap of 10 billion. And uh, Gil was on the board when their company started their program in Duchenne's market cap of 60 million and on that growth curve up to 3 billion when they had approval for that drug. So again, you know, really important appointment for the company and so, you know, we think that uh, the, the, the uh, non-executive director, directors, along with the management team, who now, Tim, have uh, collectively nearly 60 years of experience in the development and commercialization of anti drugs, you know, positions us in a, in a, you know, strongly to be able to successfully advance the DCM program at, uh, at anti Therapeutics. Just a little bit of it, again, on the, on the disease. I know I've taken your audience through this before, Tim, but... Just a, a couple of key features. It is a devastating muscle wasting disease, affects boys only. Uh, it's caused by a faulty gene that's responsible for producing a key protein for muscle function. This protein is called dystrophin. So boys with uh, Duchenne's are unable to make enough dystrophin for normal muscle function. Over time, they lose the strength and function of their muscles. Initially, it's in the biggest muscles of the body in the lower limbs. So they lose, unfortunately, the ability to walk by the time they're about 12 years of age. The next line of muscles to cop, <laughs> cop it as it were, this, um, this uh, progressive muscle loss of the 
muscles of the upper body, so the shoulders, arms, wrists, hands. And that, you know, the muscle loss is so devastating to the quality of life of the boys because, you know, they go from being able to have a normal, uh, you know, normal uh, functioning uh, with, uh, you know, being able to do most of the basic tasks that you, you know, expect boys at that age to be able to complete to, you know, not being able to feed themselves, go to the bathroom, uh, to be able to school, use a, a computer like. So, you know, what we uh, focus on and the, and the key opinion leaders are focus on is looking to slow that progressive muscle loss and function. Uh, we've got a program targeted at, at the inf inflammation that is driving this muscle loss and function. Today, the only way of treating the inflammation of the muscles is through a, a drug class called a corticosteroids, first approved over 60 years ago. So there hasn't been a, a new innovation in the field in all that time. They're not effective, Tim, and come with some really substantial side effects listed there uh, as you know, uh, both growth and mental retardation, they cause osteoporosis. And, you know, they are really a uh, an unfortunate necessity, you know, for these boys because they have nothing else, particularly the boys that have become non-animal, which is the focus of our therapy. Uh, we've got a, a drug that works by a, a in a completely different mechanism to be able to be used uh, alongside the corticosteroids. We're the only company in the world that has a drug working through this unique mechanism. Uh, at any one time, over 50% of the boys that have Duchenne's are non-ambulant. So it's a huge market opportunity, Tim, uh, you know, in desperate need for a better therapy. I've taken, you know, again, as I said, the, the, your audience through this data before, but for those maybe that haven't seen our clinical data, you know, we've uh, reported the drug to be safe and well tolerated in a six month study that we ran at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Victoria, which has the biggest clinic in the Southern Hemisphere treating boys with Duchenne's. We're able to show this drug to be safe and well tolerated, setting us up to be able to go into longer uh, uh, studies uh, in more patients, which is our plan with our phase two B clinical trial. So we've shown, uh, though, in those studies, Tim, that we can have a positive effect on disease progression. And as I mentioned, in the boys that are non-ambulant, which was the focus, initial focus of our program, we've been able to show that we can arrest that uh, muscle strength and function loss of the upper limbs in the boys and do that better than what's being achieved with the corticosteroids alone. So we've got really encouraging data. The key opinion leaders have told us what's really exciting about the data, Mark and the Antisense team, is it's shown to have effect across multiple measures of, of disease progression in these Duchenne's patients. And that's what's giving us great encouragement to move into this next study, Tim, in our phase to be clinical trial, again in non-ambulant patients, again, a population with nothing today available to them beyond these drugs that are ineffective and cause uh, these uh, substantial side effects. So we're looking, Tim, to run a study in 45 patients. We're going to have two dosing arms, 25 milligram once weekly and 50 milligrams once weekly administered subcutaneously. So this program comes with the convenience of being able to potentially, uh, with a commercial product, allow for patients to be able to self-administer the drug at home which is a huge advantage, you know, for boys who have this level of disability. And we're going to compare the data to uh, placebo arm, which will be boys just on the corticosteroid. The main uh, endpoint will be this uh, measurement of their performance of blood volume two function and strength. That's a key endpoint for, for assessing activity in boys that are non ambulant with the disease. It's the regulatory approvable endpoint that the that the regulatory authorities want to see benefits on. We've already shown a benefit on this in phase two clinical trials, team, which gives us tremendous confidence leading into this uh, phase two B, uh, clinical trial for uh, us to be able to show a significant improvement on this parameter. We're going to run the study in uh, four countries, three in Europe, one a um, couple of sites in Australia, 13 trial sites to enrol the 45 patients. We're on track to kick that study off this uh, this year. We're expecting to have last patient to end of the study, third quarter of 23. Six months after the, the, they, they complete the dosing, we'd be looking to report the trial results. So um, I guess at the end of the day, though, you know, what the shareholders, investors are 
need to sort of be focused on, I think, is the huge market opportunity that presents here. At the low end of the innovative you know, pricing for the Duchenne's market, Tim, you know, we've listed here at you know, US $200 per annum treatment, uh, but some of the therapies in the US have been charged at nearly a million dollars you know, annually for a treatment, but we've been conservative with our pricing estimate here. Uh, with about 20,000 boys that are non-ambulant with the disease, that equates to a potential $4 billion market opportunity. It's why companies like Serecta Therapeutics have a market cap of $10 billion, and we think you know, we're well positioned to leverage that. Just a couple of slides, Tim, to finish up on our pipeline. It's important for us, I think, to talk to what's coming you know, beyond the Duchenne's uh, opportunity because you know, think deep pipelines equate to de-risk businesses. We've got um, the ability here with our focus on looking to expand the clinical application of A1102 to leverage off the data that we've already uh, successfully generated on A1102 in Duchenne's and other clinical indications like MS. We're looking then to be able to you know, leverage that into other rare disease settings. And we've got a really exciting prospect in limb girdle muscular dystrophy R2. I'll talk a little bit about that in subsequent slide. But what I want to point to shareholders too is we have the ability, Tim, because of all this data we've generated previously, to leap into clinical development with this program. We don't have to contemplate more top studies or a phase one study. We can go straight from animal studies into studies into patients. So these are the two key initiatives that we're, uh, three key, key initiatives rather, that we're running at the moment. We've got a long-standing successful collaboration running with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. I talked about this other rare, you know, rare muscle disease called limb girdle muscular dystrophy R2. This is a, a, a muscle wasting disease that affects people in early adulthood. Uh, there's about 4,000 sufferers in the US. With this indication, there are no approved treatments. They have nothing available beyond having to manage it through physiotherapy. So there's a desperate need for better therapies here. We think that uh, the market opportunity here, like in Duchenne's, could be multi-billion, Tim, contemplating the pricing that's likely to come here uh, in this space. Uh, we've reported uh, positive animal results. We've got a planned chronic mouse study that we're going to run. We've got mice that have, that have been provided to us by the Jane Foundation in the US. This is a not-for-profit foundation set up in the US with the specific goal of finding a cure for Duchenne's, oh, sorry, for limb girdle muscle dystrophy. And so uh, we're, we're very excited to be partnered with the Jane Foundation. They're providing us tremendous support. So we're looking forward to start and report on that study. We also have a really exciting uh, preclinical program running where we're looking to use our drug, Tim, in combination with the dystrophin restoration drug. So these are the ones that are being sold by Sarepta Therapeutics. Last quarter alone, they sold over you know, 250 million Aussie for the quarter. Uh, so they're on track to be a billion dollar selling uh, drug category in the US alone. So we're looking at the opportunity to use our drug in combination with the dystrophin drugs to be able to show improved therapeutic outcomes than just using the dystrophin restoration drugs alone. So that study's underway. We're expecting a complete dosing this month with results to follow shortly after. So that's something that our shareholders should be excited about. Uh, we also have, a, have a, a collaboration with a leading neurovirologist in the US, Professor Igor Koralnik. He's at the Northwestern NeuroCovid Clinic in Chicago. This is a, an area where there's a desperate need for you know, better treatments and better diagnostic approaches. Tim, over 20 million people afflicted in the US alone with long COVID, with the neurological complications of, of the disease, including highly debilitating brain fog. So there's, there is, has been now a cry for better blood markers to be able to diagnose this disease. They proved elusive to date. We undertook a welfare study with Professor Koralnik's system where we looked at the blood samples from long COVID patients that he previously assessed in clinical studies. We looked at the blood of these patients and at 7,000 unique blood markers in you know, these patients, Tim, that this comprehensive screen has never been conducted before. We had announced to the market, we found some really exciting 
diagnostic markers and also therapeutic uh, targets. We file patents, you know, around the diagnostic and therapeutic targets that we've identified. So now we're in uh, commercial discussions with companies to look to exploit that novel IP that we developed. So that's a watch this space for our shareholders. Last slide, Tim, just talks to these upcoming uh, key events and catalysts. There is, of course, the progress of our phase two clinical trial. This is the you know, major program at the company. So we're looking forward to talk to the submission of the trial applications, approval and trial initiation. Uh, we're also talking, as I mentioned before, uh, expecting to speak soon on the data from our combination study, Tim, that'll be out soon. And we think there'll be a lot of you know, interest around that data, given the sales potential that uh, that those Sarepta type exon skipping drugs are, are showing. Looking to have our phase two clinical trial results published in a peer reviewed journal because we know the valid important validation that comes to have our data in such uh, high quality journals. The starting and initiation of the limb girdle muscular dystrophy study and further outcomes from our long uh, COVID. Uh, work that we're doing with Eagle Karani. So a rich news flow, a catalyst uh, pipeline anticipated in the near term, Tim. So I'd like to think that our shareholders should be, you know, anticipating that news coming through. Sure. No, thanks for walking us through that story again, Mark. We do have quite a few questions to get through. Um, Glenn asked, when will we see the results of the combination drug Mice trial, uh, I think you sort of answered that in your presentation. You're finishing up the dosing this month and then interpretation of the data, you know, will sort of happen in the next, the following month. And then I assume Q1 is when we'll sort of see the data or are you expecting to release that before Christmas? No, be, uh, earlier than that, uh, Tim. Oh, so okay. yeah, just as you described, we'll finish dosing in November, results shortly thereafter. So be either uh, December, oh, sorry, November or in, into December. Perfect. And Daryl Mew, he asked a similar question, but, you know, we sort of answered part one of that. Uh, he asked, what kind of challenges are you seeing, I guess, in that trial, or has everything gone smoothly? No, everything's on schedule, Tim. So nothing that's uh, that's emerged that's, uh, you know, changed our views on the timing and reporting of trial results. So, so far, so good. All right. No, excellent. Good to hear. Um Someone asked about the reasoning behind going for a phase 2B trial versus doing um, the first, uh, sorry, uh, phase 2B slash uh, trial. So, you know, obviously 2B is cheaper, quicker, slightly smaller. Um, you know, what was the the reasoning behind that? I mean, that's definitely one of the, one of the drivers, Tim, was around the economics. The, the other sort of important consideration was it, it did allow the company the opportunity to be reporting definitive data a lot earlier than what would have been anticipated had we pushed forward with our plan to run a phase two B three clinical trial. So, you know, with the way that you know the the study now is uh, designed and anticipated, you know, we're looking at being able to talk to definitive trial results as early as you know, uh, the first part of twenty twenty four. So that's you know considerably sooner than what we would have been looking at for the for the phase two B three clinical trial. We think it will substantially de-risk the program moving you know the the study from that point on. Also potentially brings an opportunity, Tim. You know, depending on how the data presents and how compelling the data is, as an opportunity to go back to the regulatory authorities in both Europe and US to talk about accelerated pathways to, to commercialization. So yes, one of the you know, reasons for us to, you know, of going down that way was to, to best deploy our existing capital reserves to, you know, given the market conditions to avoid having to go back and do a highly dilutive raising that the you know tough you know pricing that's been you know having to be considered now you know for, for such financings get into the clinic as quickly as we can. This is what this is allowed and get data promptly. Great. Uh, yeah, that, that all makes sense to, to me. Um, I think we can do sort of one last question. Um, you know, is there any, 
what's the corporate strategy here? Just combining a couple of questions um, to sort of provide value for shareholders, you know, seeing as the last time we did a race was at 24 cents. Uh, is it to go to the U S you know, uh, potentially for looking for partnership opportunities or, you know, um, or, you know, is there another strategy in play here? Yeah. No, thanks, Tim. And, and uh, all you know, very reasonable questions to ask, just given the, the time considerations and not to, you know, eat into, uh, into James's uh, uh, presentation. We will be addressing all these points at our upcoming AGM. It's on the 17th of November, Tim. So the expectation is all those important considerations will look to to you know articulate on at, at the AGM. So you know I'd, I'd encourage our shareholders or anyone interested you know in uh, in hearing the coming talk to it strategy. It will be a hybrid AGM, so there'll be opportunity for people to log on virtually, listen to the company uh, talk to its you know its strategy and, and its rationale for why we've moved forward with the phase to be, what we're thinking about with partnering, what we're thinking about, you know, with adding, you know, shareholder value. But in the, you know, in the short term, it's all those catalysts, Tim, that we highlight that I highlighted in my final slide. They're all anticipated to drive the share price up. Yeah, beautiful. And we'll, we'll be looking forward to those uh, eagerly, I'm sure. Thanks for taking the time today, Mark. Uh, and, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Appreciate it, Tim. Thanks again.